looking at the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation. And uh, tonight we're, this is the second uh, study in this chapter, and uh, we're only going to be dealing with verses 6 through uh, 13 tonight. And then next week, Lord willing, we'll pick up the remainder of the chapter. So if you have your Bibles, you can follow me as we read uh, from the Word of God, beginning at verse 6. We read these words. Then I saw another angel flying high overhead with the eternal gospel to announce to the inhabitants of the earth and to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He spoke with a loud voice. Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship the one who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And another, a second angel, followed saying, It has fallen. Babylon the great has fallen. And she made all the nations drink the wine of her sexual immorality, which brings wrath. And another, a third angel, followed them and spoke with a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath which is poured out in full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the sight of the holy angels and in the sight of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will go up forever and forever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or anyone who received the mark of its name. This calls for endurance from the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus Christ. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so they will rest from their labors since their works follow them. So tonight's lesson is about angelic proclamations. Now there are three angelic proclamations. And uh, we're going to be looking at them this evening. And these messages are given or sent by angels. Actually they come from the throne of God. God dispatches these angels to, to give these messages to the people that are dwelling upon the earth during that period of time that we've been studying and looking at called the Great Tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble. And uh, that is a limited period of time. And so it's that period of time at the end of the age. Right up to the very end of the age, Jesus said, I'll go with you to the very end of the age. And this is leading up to the return of the coming of Jesus Christ in that period of time known as the Great Tribulation. And here the Apostle John is conveying the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given to him in the form of angelic proclamations. As I said, there are four, actually four, there are three angels, but there are four proclamations. Each of these proclamations have a purpose in mind. God does everything with a purpose in mind. And he is here providing incentives to believers and encouraging them to stay the course. Keep on keeping on. Keep the faith. And as you are longing for the appearing of Jesus Christ, hang in there. At the same time, these warnings are for unbelievers as well that if they reject the Lamb of God, they will experience the same fate that is going to be experienced by the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the devil himself. In other words, the choice is made very clear here. People either will worship the one true God 
or they will worship the devil. And this is the way it is today as well. There are actually, when you stop and think about it, there's actually only two religions in the world. No, I know there are many different religions, but it comes down to two different categories. It is either the religion of human achievement and good works, or it is the religion of divine accomplishment. We depend either upon the good works that we do or we depend upon God's marvelous grace and his love, his redemption. Note what uh, we're, we're told in the book of John. That, uh, if, if you have your Bibles and, or if it's up on, the, uh, up on the screen as well, John chapter 9 uh, or 8 verses 42 to 47. In verse 42, we read these words. Jesus said to them, here's Jesus speaking to the crowds. And he said, if God were your father, remember they said, we have Abraham as our father. The, uh, they are children of God because they were sons of Abraham. And he said, if God were your father, you would love me, Jesus said, because I came from God and I am here. For I didn't come on my own, but he sent me. Why don't you understand what I say? Because you cannot listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and he is the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Who among you can convict me of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe in me? The one who is from God listens to God's words. This is why you don't listen because you are not from God. So Jesus is making it very clear here. <coughs> there are only two choices. People either worship the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, or they worship the devil. There's only two ways to go. The beast worshipers in our text refuse to hear the words of God despite his repeated efforts to proclaim his word to them. So this brings us to verse 6 in our uh, text, John 14 at verse 6. And we have here the first angelic message. It says in verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying high overhead, well, it, uh, what we have here is that uh, this angel is uh, flying through the sky. This is where the birds fly. It's high enough for uh, people to, to, to see uh, all over the world. Uh, he'll be flying across the globe. And he says, I saw another angel flying high overhead with, he's got something in his hands. It's the gospel. It's called the eternal gospel. To announce, he says, to the inhabitants of the earth, to every nation, to every tribe, to every language, and to every people. Now, talk about God's mer mercy and his love. This is absolutely amazing when you stop to think about it. You have to keep in mind what's going on at this time. That at this point, Chaos is reigning all over the earth. There is devastation everywhere you look. God has already released the seven seal judgments that we covered weeks ago, followed by the seven trumpet judgments. The world is indulging at this time in all kinds of immorality and debauchery. It is a lawless world. Antichrist is reigning supreme, demanding the world worship him. Christians are being martyred by the thousands, and Jews are being slaughtered. And yet, in the midst of all this chaos, we see the amazing grace of God piercing through the darkness 
and once again pursuing. He is inviting. He is warning and pleading with all mankind to repent from their sins, fear God, and give Him glory. Now, keep in mind uh, also, as we've studied over the past, at this time, He has already released the 144,000 sealed saints. He has His two anointed witnesses and gifted with, with gifts of healing, with gifts of miracles, bringing miracles that were not seen before. He has these two anointed and gifted witnesses along with a multitude of other Christian people who have refused to take the mark of the beast. And all of them are still giving witness to Jesus Christ at this time. And now on top of that, he sends a series of angels to call men to repentance. That brings us to verse 6. That tells us what the angels proclaim. Know what, he, what, they're, what, what he's proclaiming. He's proclaimed what is called the eternal gospel. The eternal gospel. Now, to those living on the earth, they're hearing the good news. That's what the gospel is. It's, it's good news. It includes the death, the burial, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's the gospel in a nutshell. But this is the same gospel that Jesus was preaching when he was here amongst us. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, he said. Over and over again, he told them to repent, to turn to him. Come unto me, he says. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And so this is the same gospel that Jesus preached. It's the same gospel that Jesus taught to his disciples and he told them to go into all the world and preach this gospel to every creature. It's the same message that the Apostle Paul preached. And if you go to Galatians chapter 6, this is a very important passage of Scripture. Galatians chapter 1 verses 6 through 8, where the Apostle Paul warned the churches of Galatia who he had come to them with the gospel of Jesus Christ that it was by faith that you're saved, by grace that you're saved through faith and that's not of yourselves. It's a gift from God. And he's, then he, he noticed that something happened to them over the years. And in verse 6 he says, I am amazed. I am absolutely amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel. There is no other gospel. There's only one gospel. And he says not that there is another gospel, but that there are some who are troubling you and they want to distort the gospel of Jesus Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Now notice it says that this gospel was being preached by this angel. It's called the eternal gospel. And it's being preached to every nation, every tribe, and every tongue signifying the global context of this message. It was a message that God intends to spread throughout the entire earth. This message is good news. However, I must admit that it does contain some bad news. Would you agree with me? Yes. Yes, because the good news of the gospel always has to begin with the bad news. That all men are sinners. And therefore... They stand condemned by a holy God. Romans 3.23 says, For all, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so the wrath of God abides upon all those who do not believe 
in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior. There's nothing that man can do to save himself. He's totally helpless. He is utterly dependent upon a merciful God. So unless God does something and unless man responds in repentance and faith, he's going to endure eternal damnation. Therefore, the gospel is good news. God has made a way of escape. And that way is by responding in childlike faith to the invitation that he extends to the world. This gospel, this good news, is described in various ways throughout the word of God. It's called the gospel of peace. This gospel brings peace. There's no peace for the wicked, but Jesus says, I am your peace. I will give you peace. Come unto me and I'll give you peace. The gospel is called the gospel of God. Elsewhere it's called and referred to as the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. It is the eternal gospel. For it was decreed in eternity past, and it is for all eternity And it means that sinners can be forgiven and they can have eternal life. So why turn to some other gospel? Jesus is offering you life. He's offering you life to raise you up from the dead because in Ephesians we're told that the man without God is dead in his trespasses and sins. But Jesus quickens us and makes us alive in Jesus Christ. So no one living on earth at this time is going to have an excuse for not hearing the message of salvation. Note also verse 7 says that the angel spoke with a loud voice. His voice controls the volume and it is loud enough to drown out all other voices. So the proclamation comes at this time in fulfillment of the word of God because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 verse 14 this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations and then the end shall come. Well you say I thought that was the job of the church. Well it is the job of the church. That's what he's commanded us to do. Go and teach the gospel to every nation baptizing them in the name of the Father the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But here it's at the, it, it appears that the church has failed to fulfill its mission, just like Israel failed to fulfill its mission when he called them to be a nation of priests unto God, and they failed to fulfill their calling. And the church has, at this time, failed to fulfill its calling as well. And so now God has to send an angel to proclaim the message where the church has failed to fulfill its mission. This has always been God's plan. He is no respecter of persons. He's not willing that any should perish and he go to great lengths in order to secure man's salvation. It was the commission that he gave to his disciples, as I just told you. When this angel is dispatched from the throne of heaven, To carry this message, God is saying to the world, this is your last chance before judgment comes. Either fear God and worship the God of the Bible, the God that made the heavens and the earth and the waters. Fear and worship him, not the beast who claims that he is God. For God will not share his glory with any. He alone is God. He alone is the creator of all things. And he tells us that. If you want to look it up for yourself in Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 19, where Jesus uh, Jesus is the one who has created all things, all things that exist because Jesus created them. Now, Note also the theme of this angelic message in verse 7. It says, fear God and give him glory. Fear God 
and give him glory. As I look around the world today, I, I see people fearing just about everything else but God. People are afraid that they're going to lose their jobs. They fear that. They fear they're losing their freedom. They put a great deal of emphasis on freedom. People fear free, losing their, their health and their health benefits. They fear losing their social security. They fear the government. And there are people today that are going to bed fearing who's going to be our next president of the United States. Now, <laughs> but no fear of God before their eyes. There's no fear of the God. Note the warning words that Jesus gives us in Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, <coughs> excuse me, um, verse 4 and 5. Verse 4 says, this is Jesus speaking. He tells us what we really need to fear. He says, I say to you, my friends, don't fear those who kill the body. Now, you've got to remember that he's speaking to people who are dying daily. There's people daily dying at this particular time in the history of our world during that great tribulation. Christians are being killed. Jews are being killed. He says, I say to you, my friends, don't fear those who kill the body. And after that can do nothing more. But I will show you the one to fear. Fear him who has the authority to throw people into hell after death. Yes, I say to you, this is the one to fear. Aren't five sparrows sold for two pennies, yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight? Indeed, the hairs of your head are all counted. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Isn't that good news to hear from the Lord himself saying to us, what do we have to fear? We have nothing to fear. They may take your life. Man can do that. Satan can do that. You may, may die, but God says, I'll raise you up again. I'll give you new life. I'll raise you right up from the dead. So we have nothing to fear. Now, this brings us to the second angelic message, and it's only contained in one verse of Scripture. Uh, chapter 14 and at verse 8. <laughs> so listen to these words. He says another, a second angel. So this is the second angel that's coming from the throne of God, going through the heavens, and he's declaring and proclaiming a very loud message. And he says, uh, it, it has fallen. What has fallen? Babylon. Babylon. The great has fallen. And then note what it said about Babylon. She made all the nations drink the wine of her sexual immorality, which brings about the wrath of Almighty God. All nations are involved here. Drinking the wine, it says, of her fornication. And uh, so there's a lot to, to examine here about Babylon. First comes a message of salvation to all the world. And then the world is informed that Babylon has fallen. Now, this is, the only, this is only the announcement of the fall of Babylon and Babylon's coming judgment. In other words, it has not yet occurred at this point in history. In fact, we're, 
we're going to be studying it when we get to chapter 16 through 18. There's two whole chapters that are devoted to Babylon, this great harlot. And it's important for us to wrestle with this. Uh, it is a, a, a difficult study. There are thousands of books on the marketplace that you could find all devoted to the subject of Babylon and who Babylon is. Now, the subject of Babylon, as I said, is going to be taken up when we, when we get to chapters 16 and 18, but we're introduced to it here. <coughs> and uh, in the future chapters, the Lord is going to reveal much about the, the city of Babylon. It's called a city. If you read chapters 17 and 18, and I would advise you to do that before you come here when we study it, uh, uh, in person when we actually study it um, because you need to wrestle with some of this, these scriptures. Uh, it's a hard subject, difficult subject. There are a lot of diverse opinions and you need to have your own opinion. You need to form your own opinion but you need to form it based upon what the Bible says, not upon what man says. For now, I just say that this city called Babylon is a very powerful city. Uh, it is going to be a very influential city. Uh, it is a city that is so great that it has influenced all the nations of the earth. Now think of that. All the nations of the world are under the influence of this particular city, that end times Babylon, that causes all the nations of the earth to drink of her wine. Now we're going to be learning uh, ab about this city and we're going to be learning about the wine that she uses. What does wine do? It makes you drunk. <laughs> you drink enough of it, it's going to make you drunk. And, and it, 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 it causes you to behave in ways that you wouldn't normally behave had you not taken of that wine. And wine has influence for evil upon people. And this wine is, also works in the same way. It works in an evil way to control the minds of society and the world. Now, all nations are affected by this city of Babylon, causing them to drink the wine of her fornication. So, who could this be speaking about? What did she cause the nations to drink? What city can you think of that has so much power, so much influence in the world? today. Is it Rome? Is it the Vatican? There are, there are multitudes of Christians that hold to this position. There's multitudes of books that hold to this position that Babylon is Rome revived, a revived Rome in the last days. Some say that it's the Vatican. The Pope is the Antichrist. Uh, I do not hold to that opinion, and so I'm just gutting the cat out of the bag ahead of time. Is it revived Babylon in Iraq? Some say that uh, the Babylon, you know, of the Old Testament days was destroyed. But many Bible teachers teach that Babylon is going to rise again out of the ashes. And it's going to rise up where it originally existed in the land of Iraq. That's where the original Babylon existed, on the Euphrates River. And so there are those that hold that this description of Babylon that's given to us in chapter 17 and 18 is a revived Babylon from Iraq. Others teach that it's New York City or the United States of America itself because they say 
<coughs> Babylon is very is depicted as being very rich, very powerful. And who can compare with the wealth that we have here in the United States? So there are many good reasons why people look to the United States and New York City as being the possible Babylon of Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Or is it some other city like Mecca where two and a half billion people every day bow down five times and face towards Mecca? That's a lot of influence, isn't it? That's a lot of influence in the world. What city has greater influence than Mecca? Well, uh, I'm going to leave you hanging here for a while because I want you to come back and when I'm teaching Revelation 17 and 18. <laughs> I got to have an audience. <clears throat> to understand who or what Babylon is, it is necessary for us to go back to God's Word and recall what the Old Testament Scriptures teach us about Babylon. I'm sure you remember the story about the Tower of Babel. <coughs> After the flood, the people got together and they built this tower that reached, the Scripture says, into the heavens because, excuse me, they wanted to make a name for themselves, we're told. And this made God very angry. So what did God do? He came down and he says, well, we're going to confuse their tongues in order to restrain them from the evil things that they imagine to do. And we're told this, and, and we're not going to go to it because it, it takes us a little too much time. But Genesis chapter 11, 4 through 9, you can read it for yourselves. But read about the, the Tower of Babel and how God confused the tongues of the people there and, and scattered them over the face of the earth. That was Genesis, 4. Genesis chapter 11, 4 through 9. You can read the whole chapter to, to get the full picture. Strong's Concordance gives this definition for Babel or Babylon. It says, uh, a, uh, this is H894, and the Strong's Concordance, is for those of you that have a Strong's Concordance, it says uh, it means confusion by mixing. So Babylon represents confusion or the mixing of truth with error. That's what is involved here. Now, the second thing we learned about Babylon, we, we learned from Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. You remember that it was Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, that, that uh, built this great city known as the city of Babylon. And... Uh, it's known for its hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And in Daniel chapter 4, at verse 30, we read these words. Nebuchadnezzar came out on the balcony one day after he had built this magnificent city and he says, Is this not Babylon the great that I have built? to be a royal residence by my vast power and by my majestic glory. He was gloating. He was very proud of his accomplishments. And he was taking credit that he was the one that did all this. And this made God very angry. Babylon is a city that represents pride and the putting of oneself above God. That's what Nebuchadnezzar did. Another thing we need to understand about Babylon is that it represents Satan's kingdom. 
It represents his efforts to steal authority and honor that belongs to God and God alone. Isaiah the prophet compared Babylon with Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14 at verse 14 who said, he said, I will make myself like the most high God. You see how proud, it was proud that brought Lucifer down. And later in Revelation, Babylon is seen as a great prostitute sitting on many waters and riding upon this beast or this dragon. We, we read about it in Revelation chapter 17, uh, and we'll just read the first five verses just to get your feet wet in the subject. Then one of the seven angels, chapter 17, verse 1, then one of the seven, <coughs> seven angels who had the seven bowls, came and spoke with me. Come, I will show you the judgment of the notorious prostitute who is seated on many waters. The kings of the earth committed sexual immorality with her, and those who live on the earth became drunk on the wine of her sexual immorality. Then he carried me away in the spirit to a wilderness. Now, I, I want you to uh, underline that word uh, wilderness in your Bibles because we're going to come back to it when we get there and study. And you'll find out that uh, you need to ask yourself, what, what kind of a wilderness is he talking about? He says that he was taken to a wilderness and shown this vision, shown this drag shown this prostitute in the wilderness. Well, uh, in Matthew chapter 24, the same word is translated desert. Jesus said, if any of you, uh, if they tell you, lo, behold, he is here, lo, behold, he is out here in the desert, don't you believe it. He said, don't you believe it? You want to know how I'm going to come? Well, as the lightning shines from the east to the west, even so shall the Son of Man come. It's going to be as the light. Everybody's going to know it when he comes. There's not going to be anything secretive about it. There's no secret coming of Jesus Christ. And here, John is taken out into a desert and shown this great city, this great harlot. So it's a, it becomes a, a, a point of identification as to what is the location of this, you see. He didn't take them to New York City. He didn't take them to Rome. He took them out in the desert and showed them. So keep that in mind. The Bible often describes God's people who have become unfaithful to him and then align themselves with political powers, he describes them as being prostitutes. They're prostituting themselves by serving other gods, by worshiping other idols and other gods. And you know that's an affront to God Almighty. He is, uh, it, 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 it incurs his anger because he said in the very first of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have what? No other gods before me. Thus saith the Lord. He's opposed to us worshiping other gods. It's God very angry. And then this spreads throughout the whole world. The whole world is following after this beast. So putting it all together... Babylon represents throughout the scriptures, it represents pride, it represents arrogance, it re represents rebellion against the commands of God or the word of God. It's doing things our way, remember Frank Sinatra, do it my way, let's do it my way rather than God's way. 
The Bible warns us again and again not to be deceived by this sort of thinking. Proverbs tells us that the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. Proverbs 12, verse 15. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 3 tells us, For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So this end times Babylon is a combination of ideas that spread throughout the whole world through humanism, through false religion, and political indoctrination. It includes confusion and the mixing of truth with error. The book of Revelation tells us, sadly, that those who should be God's people fall into the trap described by the unfaithful woman riding on the beast. And this suggests to us that so-called Christians will join with political forces or governments and use deception and force to make people do what they think is right. When in actuality, the opposite of what the Bible says to do. In other words, they swallow the wine of Babylon. And look at Revelation chapter 18, verses 2 and 3. It says, he called out in a mighty voice, it has fallen. Babylon the great has fallen. She has become a home for demons, haunts for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, and a haunt for every unclean and despicable beast. For all the nations have drunk the wine of her sexual immorality, which brings wrath. The kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown wealthy from her sensuality and excess. So this is why the book of Revelation needs to be taught in the churches today. Because in the last days, there is going to be widespread deception. And Paul warns us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that there is going to be a great apostasy, a great falling away from the truth. And my friends, when it says that there is going to be a great apostasy, apostasy, he's talking to the church at Thessalonica. He's reminding that it's actually going to take place in the church, a departure from the pathway of truth. Now, you would think that Christians should be wise enough to spot such nasty character traits, and yet Jesus and the apostles warn us again and again, do not be deceived. Go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew at chapter 24, and let's just look at a, a few places where Jesus warned his disciples in verses 4 and 5, <coughs> 24, 4 and 5, Jesus replied to them, he's talking to his disciples, it's, there's, there's a passage that says that if it wasn't for the shortening of those days, even the very elect would be deceived. So this gives us an idea of the climate that is going to exist in the last days. And, and Jesus replied in verse 4, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying that I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many Many people. Go to verse 11 of the same chapter. Many false prophets will rise and deceive many because lawlessness will multiply. The love of many will grow cold. You see, as lawlessness increases and as persecution increases, there's a falling away. There's a departure from the truth. Go to verse 24 of chapter 24 of at verse 24, it says, For false messiahs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible. There's the verse. Even the very elect. 
Satan and the beast are at this time deceiving all the world. This is their main method of operation. Through deceit, they conquer. But the good news is that it is about to come to an end. Babylon, <coughs> the angel cries out, Babylon is fallen. Babylon the great has fallen. She made all the nations drink the wine of her sexual immorality, which brings wrath. And so God pours out his wrath upon Babylon, and it's <coughs> totally destroyed and with such a devastation that it never experienced in the past, even though it was destroyed. And God destroyed it, came down and destroyed it. This is going to have a greater destruction than at any other time in history. Now this brings us to the third angelic message. It's found in verse 9 through 11. 14, chapter 14 at verse 9. And we read there, another, a third angel followed them and spoke with a loud voice. And here's what the message of the third angel is. If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the sight of the holy angels and in the sight of the Lamb. Now this message is not only loud, but it is frightening as well. Now, please don't run away. <laughs> I promise you, if you hang in there with me, you will discover how full of love this message actually is. This is simply one of those passages in Revelation that gives some people a lot of anxiety. But God often sends us loud messages because he wants to keep us safe. He's not willing that any should perish, the scripture says. He wants to protect us from the terrible consequences of sin and the terrible suffering that he has, it has caused for so long in our world. Now many people today blame God for all the suffering that exists in the world. Have you met them? They are mad at God for letting pain and evil exist. And they cry out to God, Why did you let this happen to me? I thought you were supposed to be a loving God. How could you allow this to happen? Well, God tells us with this third angel that he will not let evil go on in his world forever and forever. Our great and merciful God, our patient God, will one day stand up and say, I've had enough. That's it. Our God is a God of mercy, but he is also a just God. And all throughout history, we have seen his justice mixed with mercy. We have all sinned, and the result of sin, the Bible says, is death. So, therefore, we should all be dead right now. But God, in mercy, allows us to wake up each morning. His mercies are new from day to day, we're told. And look at Lamentations. I think it's up on the board. Through, though, though the Lord's mercies, or through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Remember that song, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. O oh God, our Father. There is coming, however, a time when God's justice will be poured out without mercy. This is why God is shouting his message of warning at the top of his lungs. This justice is called the wine, in verse 10, <coughs> the wine of the wrath of God poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. In other words, it's in, in, back in biblical days, they would take the wine and they would and stretch it by watering it down. They dilute it, stretch it, make it go further. And what God is saying here, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to dilute it. It's going to be in full measure, the wrath, my wrath. I've held it back all these centuries. I've held it back. But now, 
it's going to give full vent to his wrath. And God does not want us to experience his wrath because being separated from God's mercy is the worst possible thing that anyone can possibly imagine. And this is why God sends such a loud message. Don't worship the beast. Don't take the mark of the beast. Don't worship his image. And we need to listen to his message of love so that we can be saved and given rest instead of torment. The prophet Ezekiel says in chapter 33 at verse 11, tell them, as I live, saith the prophet, this is the declaration of the Lord God Almighty. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. This, God doesn't take any pleasure in wicked people dying. He doesn't get anything that, that, that warms his heart at all out of that. No. He says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked person should turn from his wicked ways and live. Repent, he says. Repent of your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? He pleaded with his people again and again and again. Even Jesus said, come to me. Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. My way, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And again, the apostle Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 2, God, our Savior, desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is but one God, and there is only one mediator between God and and men, and that is the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. So why did he do it? Why did he die? Well, he didn't deserve to die, did he? No. He did not deserve God's wrath upon himself. He did not deserve that. But Jesus was willing to suffer great torment and agony, the agony described in this warning of the third angel. Jesus took God's wrath upon himself so that you and I don't have to. He did this because he loved us and he wants to save us from the wrath that is to come. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Finally, a voice from heaven brings a message of encouragement. We read about that in Revelation chapter 14, verses 12 and 13. It says, this calls for endurance from the saints who keep the commandments and their faith in Jesus Christ. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so they will rest from their labor since their works follow them. First, God addressed those who refused the beast, and then he addresses those who may be considering to worship the beast. First, to the faithful to the faithful ones, he says in verse 12. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Now, we see here that at this particular time in the world's history, this period of tribulation, there's going to be a tremendous need for endurance and perseverance. So he says, blessed are those that endure. You don't you don't want to give up now, he's saying. You don't want to give up on Christ right now before he pours out his judgment. You have come so far, he's saying to the Christians on the earth. You've come so far. You're almost at the finish line and you have endured so much already. Just hang in there just a little bit longer. Hebrews chapter 10, 32 to 39 describes this <coughs> 
where the early saints were called upon to endure. And he encouraged them in Hebrews chapters 10. Read those when you get home. Well, this is the same message that our Lord wants conveyed to these suffering, struggling believers. It is a reminder to persevere and to keep on trusting. Verse 13, again, says, they write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Well, how can that be so? You die in the Lord. Blessed are you, he says, if you die in the Lord. Why? Well, <laughs> because you're... To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And you, you are removed from this world of suffering and shame and pain and trials and tribulations. And our suffering is over. We enter into a life of rest and reward. So death, death is nothing to be feared by a believer. Remember the words of the apostle who said, fear not, fear not. We, know we have nothing to fear. Paul was able to face death. He says, I fought a good fight. I finished the course. And henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness that I will receive in that day. Not unto me only, but unto all of you that are looking for his appearing. So that is what is being preached here in, by these angels. It's the eternal gospel. It's a gospel of salvation that is, is being proclaimed to the entire world just prior to the Lord Jesus Christ descending from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of Almighty God with 10,000 times 10,000 of his mighty angels following in his train. Well, we're going to finish it there tonight and we'll pick it up uh, at verse 14 next time we get together. And this is a, a very uh, key passage or portion of Scripture which talks about the great harvest that is coming upon the earth. There are two harvests that we're going to be unfolding and unpacking in that portion of John chapter 14. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father God, we thank you for your word. Words of encouragement, words of love, words of challenge, words of warning. It's all the Word of God. And we, uh, uh, we, we want to be uh, uh, advocates of those that preach the whole counsel of Jesus Christ. Not just pick and choose the things that we like, but we also want to know the, the deep things of God, the difficult things of God as well. And we depend upon your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Thank you for each one that's here tonight and those that are watching online. We ask your blessing upon them. Come into their homes and may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard and garrison their hearts, their minds, their souls and keep them in perfect peace as they keep their eyes stayed upon you. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen. and amen.